What's cracking? Big dogs. Welcome bike to the channel. Welcome bike to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is B D G E. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. It's Tuesday. Rest of the season rankings. We are talking, baby. Today we're actually only going to do the running back rankings for the rest of the season, which is literally just two weeks. So that actually means this will be the last rest of the season running back rankings video because next week won't be rest of season because that's the last week. You'll just have my weekly rankings video which I put out on Thursdays, typically, or Fridays. I forget when we put out Fade the Public. We put out Fade the Public on Thursday, so that will be Friday. I'm going to do a wide receiver one as well this week. I'm not sure when I'm going to drop it, though. Maybe Friday, maybe Saturday, maybe Thursday, before Thursday Night Football. I don't know. Whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm glad you're joining me for this one. Stick a needle in it. I don't know how I'm going to do this because I made a little chart. I'm going to put it on the screen after, after we tuck our shirts in. We stop yelling and we eat. Okay, so if at any point you enjoy this video, you don't hate what I'm saying, you find some value in it, make sure you hit the thumbs up. It's real quick. You scroll down, hit it, let's YouTube know you don't hate me. So here's this little chart. Here are my rankings. I figured this might be easiest. I'm going to slide over here so y'all can still see me, but I'll talk about the chart real quick. It's two separate charts on the left side of your screen. And I hope this is not too small for you to see. The right side might be a little bit too small. On the left side, is my rankings and before i published them and submitted them and the final rankings which will be updated throughout the week will be available on patreon patreon.com forward slash bdg are my rankings but before i publish them it shows you the biggest risers and fallers there so you can see the green and yellow or the green and uh red arrows moving up and down there uh so rather than going to just the biggest rise and falls. You can kind of see all of them. I figured I'd just fucking open up the floodgates for the final two weeks or the final video of this. And you've got little note column there. And on the right side, you see the schedules for the next two weeks of each team. So for instance, you can see Derrick Henry is number one on the running back rankings. Obviously plays for Tennessee. On the right side of the chart, you can go to Tennessee down at the bottom. You see Detroit and Green Bay. Hopefully you guys can see that. Just fucking zoom in a little bit more if you can. Put my ass on the widescreen. Put my ass on the TV. Get me famous. Okay, that's how you get to see this. It says Detroit says Green Bay. And the percentages underneath both teams are their rankings against fantasy running backs over the last five weeks. So like the last month and a half or whatever, relative to the average. So if you go to Tennessee and you see Detroit 13.4%, that means they're allowing on average 13.4% more fantasy points to the running back position than the other teams in the NFL and in fantasy football right now. So any positive number on that chart means it's good for fantasy running backs, or at least the team has been worse than average against fantasy running backs. Anything in green means it's a good matchup for running backs. Anything in red means it's a tough matchup for running backs. Again, this is only the last five weeks, so it doesn't tell the full picture, but it tells the most recent picture. You can find these on FF Today, so fftoday.com, and then you go over to the section that says stats on the top. It's like the top header menu. It says stats, and then on the bottom left of that page, you should be able to find a section where it says FF points allowed, and then you can go position by position to look at it. You could so sort it by scoring. You could sort it by last three weeks, last five weeks of the season, whatever, whatever, whatever. We'll kind of roll through these rankings. Derrick Henry, Dalvin Cook, Austin Eckler, no change there. You could see the next group of running back rankings we do see a, a little swift movement there, okay? So you see like five guys moving up the spot. It's because Aaron Jones moves down the spot, but I want to talk about Jonathan Taylor for a second, okay? We want to talk about Jonathan Taylor because he moves up from running back 12, right? Rest of the season rankings last week had him at 12, so he was an RB1, but he balled out and moved all the way up to running back six. Monster day on the ground, 20 for 150, two tugs, including one of his signature long breakaway runs. It's what we've been waiting for, right? Those college runs that got us hard. The reason why everyone wanted to draft him at the 101. He gets two polar opposite opponents now going forward, okay? He gets Houston this upcoming week. It was allowed the single most fantasy points to running backs on the season. Just two weeks ago, the Colts played the Texans. Jonathan Taylor, 13 for 91 on the ground, 3 for 44, and a touchdown through the air, 21 fantasy points. Bike to bike games over 21 fantasy points, okay? I don't expect much to change in the game plan for the Colts in week 15. Rivers threw the ball just 28 times against the Texans last time. Colts running backs received 38 combined touches. So I think 60 to 70% of those will go Taylor's way. After week 15, though, they get Pittsburgh. Had they had two really good matchups in a row, I think you could argue Taylor in the top five, top four-ish on that borderline. 
keep them at tight. We'll keep them around running back six for now because they get Pittsburgh, who over the last five weeks has been the second toughest fantasy opponent for running bikes. And at this point in the season, though, you know, it's scratch and claw. It's winning in. You've got to just get by, get your dub, and advance to the next round. So this one week of great matchups for Jonathan Taylor, Houston, is what bolts him up to that running back six spot. Now, you'll see Cam Akers, another big time riser here, all the way up to running back seven. Another rookie running back right behind Jonathan Taylor. This is what we typically see from rookies. They start to develop over the second half of the year, um, especially down the stretch here. Usually we see it with the wide receivers. Not so not so often with the running backs. We usually kind of see them cement themselves early and often. But this year has been very, very different between Cam Akers and Jonathan Taylor and all the guys that were drafted um, in second, third round capitalish. They're starting to make their way into the starting lineup and making big impacts, right? So when we look at what he did on Thursday Night Football, man, 29 carries, 171 yards, caught two or three targets for 23 yards, so almost 200 yards from scrimmage. Now, he's at my running back nine, but I think legitimately, I think legitimately, out, you know, maybe not like where the Derrick Henry is up the running back one because the matchups are too good, but Akers has an outside chance. If there, if there are odds on this, if there's like betting odds on this, I think the best value to finish as the RB1 over these this three-week span, right, weeks 14, 15, 16, to be the overall fantasy running back one, Cam Akers would be the best value on betting odds, okay? He's not the pure favorite to do it, obviously, because there's always a chance that they go back to running back by committee. But I think it's very small. I think he's very talented. He's explosive. He can have the big play, and clearly they're trusting him now to have the big workload. So I think there's an outside chance he is the running back one in fantasy over the next couple weeks. The running back by committees in the past. Cam Akers is getting the carries, 29, ridiculous, a ridiculous number. Also running the routes, though. Ran 17 routes. Malcolm Brown only ran four. So they get the Jets, and then they get Seattle. The Jets are 16.5-point underdogs in this one, which means the Rams are 16.5-point favorites. Good math, as always. We try to provide you with fantasy analysis backed up by exquisite math. 16.5-point favorites for the Rams, which means the running backs, especially Cam Akers, should get a ton of work versus the Jets in this one. Obvious smash spot, RB1 in this spot. Then they get Seattle. Now, Seattle is obviously tougher against the run, but they've actually been bottom 10 against fantasy running backs over the last five weeks. And I think that's obviously a game where them two will probably have to battle back and forth for some points. And if Akers continues to get the majority of the route running work and running more routes than Brown and Henderson and continues to catch passes at at least the same level as those guys, I'm not worried about him being game planned out against Seattle. So he should produce regardless. Now, Aaron Jones, I went back and forth on. I wanted to drop a little bit further. I think I originally dropped him down to like RBE 10-ish. But then, you know, you look at the schedule and it's ridiculous. It's Carolina and it's Tennessee. What I wanted to point out were just some interesting numbers here. Because outside of that monster week two game where he had like 236 yards from scrimmage, but who's counting? Two touchdowns. He's been mediocre in terms of the expectations you had for him as a second round fantasy uh, second round fantasy back after that week two game you're like oh shit I probably have a top five running back in fantasy for the rest of the season if not top three if not possibility of being the overall number one back uh but that has not come to fruition he has just two single games over 20 fantasy points this year two single games last year half of his games were over like 18 fantasy points and he has just three games this year over 15.6 fantasy points and these are all half PPR numbers so if you look at a list of guys, this is a list of guys that have as many 20 fantasy point games as Aaron Jones on the year. DeAndre Swift, baller, but limited, obviously, hasn't played all the games. Neither has Aaron Jones, fairly, but these other guys behind DeAndre Swift, Naeem Hines, Latavius Murray, Rex Burkhead, Jeff Wilson, all guys that have as many 20 fantasy point games as Aaron Jones this year. It's crazy to think about, but he's kind of become a floor play, right? You look at weeks one through eight. Jones averaged 21.2 half PPR fantasy points per game, 5.6 targets per game. Obviously, Devontae Adams had missed some time, and that was a boost to his receiving game. He averaged a whole rushing touchdown per game from weeks one through eight and 0.4 receiving touchdowns per game. So almost a receiving touchdown every other game. He hasn't had a receiving touchdown since week four now. And after week eight, from weeks nine through the current week of the season, He's running in a touchdown once every three games. The dominance that Devontae Adams has had on the goal line and in the red zone is killing Aaron Jones, man. But like I said, his schedule is juicy as fuck. It's Carolina, it's Tennessee. So would anyone be surprised to see him pop off for 150 yards of scrimmage, two touchdowns? I probably wasted my time on this, to be honest, but I just thought 
there were some interesting trends that I wanted to share there. So if we keep moving down the list, David Montgomery's obviously been balling out. I don't know where that ADR touchdown run came from, but they have uh, another couple of juicy matchups against Denver or Tennessee. And then week 16 is obviously where it gets tough against Tampa Bay. So that might be a problem, but he's just so involved that his floor and he's showing some ceiling now that I think you can make the argument he just belongs in the top 10, regardless of opponent right now. Alvin Kamara, a lot of these guys, you have Alvin Kamara, who's going to be uh, extremely dependent on whether or not Drew Brees returns this week. I've heard a lot of conflicting reports. So if Drew Brees is back, like I'm probably going to move Alvin Kamara up to, you know, running back five or six. If he's not back, I'll probably keep him down around 10, maybe move him to like 11 or 12, maybe even a little, a little bit more down than that. But it, that will depend completely on Drew Brees. You have a couple other guys um, like DeAndre Swift that will have to do with Stafford, Mike Davis, and Christian McCaffrey all the way down at 17 and 20. Of course, we'll have to do with whether or not Christian McCaffrey plays. If Mike Davis, if Christian McCaffrey plays this week, Mike Davis is obviously going to be off this chart. Christian McCaffrey is going to move up to, I don't know, maybe, maybe he's a little bit limited in this game. I'll probably still put him as like the running back three maybe two. I'll have to kind of like check matchups and see how what I want to do there. They take on Green Bay this week, who has been really bad against the run on the year as a whole, but they've been a little bit better as of late, as you could see. And after Green Bay, they get Washington. The football team has been stellar against ground opponents. By Alvin Kamara, you have Kenyon Drake who moved up five spots. He just continues to get an absurd number of carries, and he continues to get an absurd number of valuable carries. He's, get, he's scoring a rushing touchdown, if not multiple rushing touchdowns, almost every single game since he's returned. He's been back since, from the ankle injury for like four or five games. He's had more goal line carries in that span than he had all of last year, almost double the number of goal line carries in the last four to five games than he had in all of 2019. So Drake, 20, 20 plus carries a game, getting all the goal line work. And now they get the... Philadelphia Eagles and San Francisco 49ers. Neither of those teams are easy to necessarily run against, uh, which is why someone who can have 25 plus touches a game could be ranked down at running back 11. But clear RB1 for me. Miles Sanders obviously had the had the bounce bike game. He's he's welcomed bike into our arms. Uh, baller, we will continue to see if Jalen Hurts is being on the field lifts that upside, lifts that ceiling for Miles Sanders that we've been desperately needing to see. They get Arizona and they get Dallas, which are two fantastic matchups for fantasy running backs. So a lot of the times, like in these rest of season rankings videos, especially at this point, I will rank guys with higher ceilings higher because you're going to win your championship. You're in the fucking fantasy playoffs and all the teams you're going against are there because they're good teams, which means they're probably putting up a lot of points and they are providing ceilings from their side of things. They put up a ceiling game. You need to put up a ceiling game, which is why I have a guy like Miles Sanders over these Chris Carsons, over the Josh Jacobs, over the guys who have a floor, but haven't really shown the ceilings yet. Chris Carson is still less than 100% clearly He's splitting the work with Carlos Hyde back there, um, but he continues to get it done. Good workload and scoring touchdowns. Um, and I mean, he moved down five spots after a good game, which is not a knock on him. It's just necessarily like Miles Sanders has a lot of upside. Kenyon Drake's getting more work and probably the same amount of valuable touches as Chris Carson. Alvin Kamara's upside is obviously through the fucking roof. If Drew Brees is bike, David, David Montgomery has been amazing. So like Chris Carson, yes, he dropped five spots, but he's still in the same tier as like the six guys above him. Josh Jacobs is just not getting it done. Uh, he's got an okay floor and his ceiling comes like once every four to five weeks where he can always roll into one or two touchdowns. Now they do get the Chargers and then Miami, which kind of a tough slate of games. You could probably argue to move Josh Jacobs below J.K. Dobbins, who scored another touchdown last night, uh, got 13 carries, didn't get a target, which is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's almost like Dobbins should probably be moved down a little bit too, because he's starting to get the work in the ground game. But Gus Edwards is taking goal line carries. They're not thrown to the running backs at all. Um, but he's another guy. He's like a ceiling player, right? He could always bust off for a monster game. And that's why he's ranked as highly. But I think I'm probably going to move him below DeAndre Swift. He'll be below either of the Carolina running backs, whoever ends up being the starter for this week. And then you have DeAndre Swift right behind him because, again, the ceiling is going to be there. I know he didn't really come, out, come away with a big productive game, but I think they're going to ease him in or they were easing him in last week. And he'll be ready to roll full go against Tennessee, who we can dominate against. Five targets in three straight games, four plus targets in seven straight games, getting a lot of the goal line work. He was obviously vultured by Carrion Johnson last week with one of them. But if he got both of those, he was looking at a very, 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 very big fantasy game. Uh, I think DeAndre Swift will move again uh, above Dobbins, possibly Jacobs, uh, because I like the ceiling there for DeAndre Swift. You have Kareem Hunt coming off a monster game last night. He hadn't really showed that kind of upside in a long time. 
but Cleveland gets the Giants and the Jets, both games in which they should be heavy favorites, which means these running backs are going to get like 77 touches again. Nick Chubb has just been absolutely fucking dominant. It's a beautiful thing to see. Kevin Stefanski, really, really fucking good job over there in Cleveland. Uh, I think anyone trying to argue the point that Brian Flores should not be the coach of the year. I know Kevin Stefanski is doing well and some other coaches are doing fine, but the Miami Dolphins were fucking miserable when he took over as the coach. They should have been like an 0-16 team last year. He led them to, I think, five wins, and this year completely turned around. They're fighting for a fucking playoff spot. I don't want to waste my breath on that, but anybody getting too cute and fucking throwing out clickbait shit about why Brian Flores should not be the coach of the year needs to shh, shut, shut your mouth. Shut your mouth, okay? Where the fuck was I? Wayne Gallman. Um, Wayne Gallman's out at 19. Uh, I, I think we kind of saw like what his we saw what his floor was really this week. He's still getting like 13, 15, 16 touches, but a lot of times that equates to like 50 to 60 yards from scrimmage. And if he gets vultured on the touchdowns that he had been getting for a while, uh, there will be a problem for a guy like him because he's only going to put you up six or seven fantasy points. I still think coin flip that he gets in the end zone from a rushing touchdown. I don't know if Devonta Freeman's going to be back this year or if he's going to be back this week. I don't think it, it impacts it that much because Wayne Gallman has looked like the far, far superior running back for the Giants. So he's a plug and play RB2. I don't think you have to ask questions about it. Clyde Edwards Hilaire took over the backfield completely, but again, you can't really trust him because they're not, you know, the, the, the Chiefs are passing the ball at the highest rate in the NFL right now. They are not letting their running backs get the goal line touches. They are not letting their running backs make explosive plays down the field. It's almost like they're running the ball just because they have to. Like Andy Reid's like, fuck, we got to mix in a run every now and then. And uh, that's where Clyde gets on the field, but he is dominating in terms of the touches and everything. So Clyde gets in there at the RB2 discussion. They do get the Colts next week and then Atlanta the week after. So a very tough slate of matchups. But if Darius Leonard is out in week 15, that's an upgrade because this run defense does not operate as well as they normally would be without a guy like Darius Leonard, who is all over the fucking field and tackling running backs left and right. And then Atlanta's obviously been fucking stifling against opposing running backs. So Clyde, tough schedule inconsistent workload, inconsistent valuable touches, moves him down there. Now, Raheem Mostert also moves down four spots just because Jeff Wilson is getting so much run. And I think this is a clear committee. I think they haven't shown anything other than that. Raheem Mostert, though, Raheem Mostert, though, though, I actually want to pull up his numbers because although it wasn't a huge game for Mostert in this one, he did get a good amount of work. 14 touches, 65 yards, also saw four targets. So 18 opportunities in this one. That that quietly went under the radar. So I still feel pretty confident starting Raheem Moser, especially against Dallas this week. They are terrible against fantasy running backs. They have allowed, let's see it. You see that green spot next to Dallas on the schedule over there. Fantasy points allowed. Dallas, they are number six on the year, but in the last five weeks, they are number three. They have allowed a lot of fantasy points to the running backs over the last five weeks. And I expect a guy like Raheem Mostert, who can kind of blast through the fucking line for an 80-yard pop at any moment, to have a big game in this one. So 18 opportunities combined with a guy who gives you that big play ability at any point. Really, really like Raheem Mostert this week. And then they get Arizona the week after that, which is not a scary matchup, obviously. Um, the rest of the rankings, I mean, Zeke moves way down. He's clearly battling that calf injury. He hasn't looked good. And now he's splitting a lot of snaps and a lot of workload with Tony Pollard. I think that might have been like a, a game script kind of thing, but they play San Fran and they play Philadelphia, two opponents that again are not very easy to run against. I don't, you know, I don't see a lot of efficiency coming for Ezekiel Elliott in this one or these next two. So hard to trust him at this point as anything more than a low end RB2. Same thing with James Conner, man. Pittsburgh just does not, you know, I said the Chiefs had the highest rate of throwing the ball. I actually want to check that out on sharpfootballstats.com. Sharp. If y'all have never used sharpfootballstats.com, it's by the dude Warren Sharp created it. It is an insane website with like all these crazy advanced statistics in terms of like personnel grouping and frequency and target volume to specific positions. It's craziness. So I want to look at neutral game script when a team is either trailing by less than a touchdown or winning by less than a touchdown. So what they would normally be doing in a normal game, I want to look at their pass to run ratio. Uh, right now, in terms of all right, well, neutral game script, you or not neutral game script, but on any given play, Pittsburgh is throwing the ball in sixty three percent of their plays, which is like the fifth highest in the NFL. KC's right behind them, sixty two percent. There we go. Okay, so adjusted for neutral game script, Pittsburgh is number one. KC is number is tied for number three. So both those teams are obviously throwing at a ridiculous rate, which is eating at the running backs. There, um, they haven't been efficient. James Conner has not been good on the ground since like week four or five. 
and uh, they're simply just not throwing the ball. So James Conner, very hard to trust. Now, Ronald Jones would be much, much higher on this list, but we just got the news breaking today that he is having surgery on that finger. He fractured a finger, and it's the same thing that his teammate Chris Godwin was dealing with, and Chris Godwin missed a game. So this is completely up in the air right now as to uh, what we're doing with Ronald Jones here. They play Atlanta, which is obviously a very tough matchup, but they get Detroit in week 16, which could be like a week winning league, a league winning fucking week for Ronald Jones. But if he misses this game, he's obviously going to stay down here because that's only one of two games left. If he's in for this game, he'll probably move up to, I would say like running back 14, maybe 13 ish. He's been really good. He's getting all the workload and they fucking sat Leonard Fournette's ass, a healthy scratch. You love to see it. You don't love to see it. I love to see it. So it's completely his backfield. I mean, I know like Shady got like four carries, but like fuck off. Like no one cares about Shady. Um, if he misses his game though, I think, you know, Fournette, Fournette, I would rather play Fournette than McCoy, but maybe they're just like fuck Fournette altogether. And we give Keyshawn Vaughn, our rookie, a little bit of play time. So obviously that's very, that ranking of Ronald Jones is very, very much up in the air and is only indicative of the finger surgery that he had. Damian Harris, uh, listen, Damian Harris is down here, gets Miami, and then he gets Buffalo. Uh, it's not like a brutal schedule, but Damian Harris, like we know his floor. Like his floor is typically like seven fantasy points, eight fantasy points because he doesn't catch passes on the goal line. We don't know if Cam's going to get the work. He needs like a very good matchup. He needs a very good matchup where they're giving him 17 carries or whatever, and he'll usually turn out like a nice, efficient 4.8, 5.2 yards per carry on those but nothing more like the ceiling is just not there. Um, so floor play. Yeah, I'm fine with Damian Harris, but we're not going to see a ceiling out of him. Melvin Gordon is down here. He's still splitting work with Philip Lindsay. Um, he's looked pretty good over the last couple of weeks, but just not an exciting guy that, you know, that I think will really push the needle anywhere. They get Buffalo, they get the chargers, both of them, as you can see on the right side, negative percentage, not tough matchups, but still a lot of guys I'd rather start than Melvin Gordon. Gus Edwards balling, man. I actually think I like Gus Edwards probably a little bit more than what I have him listed as here for. They get Jacksonville this week. They get Jacksonville this week, and that could be a game like Cleveland last night where game script dictates the running backs are getting... Actually, that's probably a fucking terrible example, but in games that they're blowing out teams, Gus Edwards is going to get a lot of fucking work, right? You don't need the big explosive plays from J.K. Dobbins in the passing game or whatever, and Gus Edwards just seems to have completely supplanted Mark Ingram in that running back one role, which means a lot of goal line carries and is a shitty, shitty Jacksonville defense. So I actually think Gus Edwards probably has a lot of uh, upside in this upcoming week. Like he could possibly score another multi-touchdown game here. And then they get the Giants a week after that, which they should probably be semi-big favorites in that one, depending on what Daniel Jones' health is. And their defense has been a little bit better, obviously. But Gus Edwards, I think, sneaky, sneaky, really good play for this week. And then we'll kind of take it week by week on that one. Uh, J.D. McKissick, I don't know. It's hard to get excited about him. Seattle is going to be a good game script for him probably. Um, but, you know, we've seen over the last couple of weeks, he's not really as involved as we expected him to be uh, through the air, right? Obviously on the ground, he's getting a, little, a few more touches with Antonio Gibson out. I expect Antonio Gibson to miss the remainder of the season. Um, but with him out, J.D. McKissick is getting more rushing workload. Not as many passing downs though, or not as many passing targets. And that's the only reason you really want to start J.D. McKissick in the first place. Then we have David Johnson there. Again, going to depend on whether or not he is bike for week 15. They play the Indy, is that Indy? Indianapolis Colts, Cincinnati. Again, Indy's going to depend on uh, Darius Leonard's health. Is that right? It's Indy. I see them like bright green and that's surprising. So I guess over the last five weeks, they have allowed a lot of points to opposing running backs, but David Johnson ain't fucking one to strike fear in the hearts of opposing defenses. All right. So he's down there. Uh, if he gets the activation, uh, he'll move up probably into the RB24-ish range around those Zeke, James Conner kind of guys. And that is all we've got for today's video. I've got nothing but love for y'all. If you have some love for me, I would love you to check out manscaped.com because they are a sponsor of today's video. I'm an idiot for plugging it this late, but if you stayed this late, that means you're very loyal to the squad. You're loyal to the brand. You're loyal to the video. And if you're loyal to us, then you want to be loyal to the people that we work with. And Manscaped.com is one of our partners for this holiday season. It is a beautiful gift for men, for women, for fathers, for sons, for husbands, for cousins. It doesn't fucking matter. It's a great, you know what? The, the best gifts are like novelty gifts that are kind of funny, but also useful. And that's what Manscaped is. It's funny. You know, it's funny. Woo, we talk about our private parts and our, our balls and shit like that. But it's also extremely useful. It's like one of my favorite products that I've 
gotten into over the last two years. It is waterproof when you go into the shower and it will not cut you. They have proprietary, proprietary technology that makes sure you are not cut on your most sensitive areas. Okay. I know we're in quarantine and everyone stops taking care of themselves, but the Manscaped performance package on there will keep you clean, smelling good, shaven, and ready to go once everybody gets the vaccines in there. Okay. It was not a political rant. I wish I didn't say that last part. Wish I didn't say it, but I did. Okay. So head over to manscaped.com. If you love me, you would be supporting us, thy brand. You will be supporting whoever you're giving the Manscaped package to. Use promo code BDGE when you check out at manscaped.com. You're going to get 20% off. You're going to get free shipping. And I love you. And I'm out.